Released by Square Enix in 2001 on the PlayStation 2 and re-released for the PS3 and Vita, director Motomu Toriyama and writer Kazushige Nojima are chosen to help create the first installment for a new console cycle. This would be the directional debut of Toriyama, and the selection came from the bold decision to make this a linear but cinematic experience. Design emphasis was intended to replicate an interactive movie, and as such, the game was less about the world and more about the characters, adding large colorful set pieces, bright detailed character models, full voice acting, inner monologues by the main character, and heavy usage of in-game cutscenes, as well as limiting open area environments and the usage of an overworld. Mechanically, the game uses a conditional turn-based battling system in which the speed of actions and cooldown times may rearrange initiative order, and the player could swap out active characters fighting from the bench in the middle of combat too. Also, the summoning mechanic has been overhauled to where summons are now their own independent characters that fight on the field as well, and play a central role to the story. Like previous installments, characters have their own individual stories and a unique ability, and while there is no job system, each character is grown individually from the same collective pool of abilities arranged in a linear spiral tree called a sphere grid. Finally, it's very heavy on puzzles and minigames, providing a relief to the gameplay pace, from temple puzzles to a monster arena to blitzball, a sport that mixes underwater football and soccer. Despite the controversial change to make an overtly linear game, Final Fantasy X is the second best-selling installment in the series, placing it just shy of Final Fantasy VII's commercial success. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size for recapitation. Set in the world of Spira, Titus is the ace player on the Xanarkand Abe's Blitzball team, and as he's on his way to the stadium for the tournament finals, he's trailed by a mysterious phantom child. It's been 10 years since Titus lost his father Jack, who was another superstar Blitzball player, and it's actually the Memorial Cup in Jack's honor that he's on his way to, despite Titus himself harboring some resentment towards his father. As all the city of Xanarkand is fixated on the game, a mysterious old man is perched high in the city to play witness to a colossal monster about to make landfall. Panic is starting to spread in the streets, as entire buildings are somehow being sucked into the phenomenon, and Titus himself becomes aware just before a salvo strikes the city and stadium. He makes his way out of the stadium when he recognizes the old man waiting for him as Orin, an old friend of his father's. As Orin leads a confused Titus closer to the Calamity, he explains that Devastator goes by the name Sin. Sin itself then releases a horde of insects, and Titus receives a blade from Orin that is said to be a gift from Jack. Despite being clumsy at first, Titus finds up between Orin's guidance and his own athleticism, he adapts to fighting rather quickly, and together they cut their way through the ranks. Orin informs Titus they are deliberately meant to go to Sin, and with nowhere left to run, Titus has no choice but to be taken in by Sin's vacuum as well. The next thing he knows, Titus wakes up in some stormy submerged ruins. Swimming towards the only visible building, he narrowly avoids getting eaten by a local monster, and after he makes a fire to stay warm to, he sleeps and dreams again of the mysterious phantom boy. He's woken up by another local predator, but this time a team of gun-wielding strangers blow their way inside and the leader chooses to help him out. However, the group knocks him out afterwards and take him captive, and he's brought to their salvaging rig. He's given an order to work or die, so he opts for the former and learns that his captor is fortunately able to translate what he's saying to the strange native tongue. He's ordered to help with their next salvage operation, which results in the discovery of a sunken airship. Titus and Riku make formal introductions, and she explains that she's part of a race called the All Bed, who make use of ancient technology called Machina, which has resulted in them being shunned by general society. She doesn't believe Titus is actually from Xanarkand, and given his encounter with Sim, she thinks he may be suffering from mental trauma or amnesia, which is a known side effect of Sim's toxins. Reason being, there is no city of Xanarkand anymore, as it was destroyed a thousand years ago. She suggests that since he claims he's a Blitzball player, then he should go to the city of Luka, where Blitzball is very popular, and he may be recognizing something or be recognized there. She offers to help him there, and warns him to stop speaking of Xanarkand, as these days it's considered to be holy by Yemen, the world's predominant religious organization. As Cetus is still in disbelief that he's been thrown a thousand years into the future, Sin passes by the boat, rocking it violently in its wake, which knocks Titus overboard and sweeps him away. The next thing he knows, he wakes up off the coast of a small tropical island that is hit by a blitzball from the local blitzball team. He returns it with his signature kick, which makes an immediate impression, and as they question who he plays for, he automatically responds his hometown of the Xanarkin Apes without thinking. He quickly corrects himself and blames the toxins on his ignorance. The man in charge introduces himself as Waka, the captain of this village's local blitzball team, the Besaid Orox. Titus asks about some history, and it's explained to him that a thousand years ago, there were once a lot of cities in Spira, and many of them running on machines. One day, Sin came by and destroyed all of the technologically advanced cities, like Xanarkand. 
As a result, many people interpreted this as some sort of divine punishment for over-reliance on technology. And so, the religion of Yevon popularized, with one of its rules forbidding use of advanced or ancient machines called Machina. Waka knows Titus must be a pro blitzball player from somewhere, so he invites him along the Besaid Orox to play in the upcoming tournament, in which every team in Spear will be present, so someone must recognize him. He agrees and Waka is excited, but confesses his team is otherwise pretty awful as they haven't won a single game in 23 years. Titus identifies the motivation problem quickly as he changes the team motto to do our best to a more decisive chance of victory. On their way back to Besaid Village, Titus also meets and learns of the Crusaders, and also that the old world sign of Blitzball victory is now the new world holy greeting. The Crusaders are a militia with the mission to battle sin and every town has them. While the job is merely driving it away from towns and such, the actual job of defeating Sin falls as a responsibility of a summoner. He is directed to the village's temple to greet their summoner, and he learns that summoners are a chosen few that can call forth powerful entities called Aeons, and have a high standing in the Yevon religion. After another dream of his childhood hating his father Jack, he follows Waka, who is on his way to check in on the apprentice summoner in the temple. Waka is a guardian, who are escorts and protectors of a summoner as they make their pilgrimage to pray at every temple across Spira before confronting Sin. They are just in time to watch the summoner, a maiden named Yuna, emerge successfully from the cloister and validate her success by calling forth her first Aeon, Valifor. Later, Titus introduces himself to Yuna and the two take a liking to each other. That night, as he awakens from another dream about hating his father, he overhears one of Yuna's guardians, the black mage Lulu, warn Waka not to indulge Titus just because he happens to look nearly identical to his younger brother Chapu, a crusader who died in an attack by Sin. Waka even promises that after his last tournament, he intends to retire from Blitzball and become guardian full time. The next morning, Waka gives Titus Chapu's old sword and teaches him about the Calm, a time during which Sin is not active, and this last one has lasted 10 years thanks to Yuna's father, High Summoner Braska. Before everyone departs on a ship leaving the Seid, Titus is assaulted by Kamari, another of Yuna's guardians, who is a blue beast man of a species called the Ronzo, and also knows monster special attacks like Blue Mage. Waka himself is a more ranged fighter, able to strike foes with his Blitzball, as well as a gambler, using slots, status effects, and his strong luck to tip the odds in his favor. On the open seas en route to Luka Island, the pilgrimage has them also making a stop on Kalika Island, as there is a temple there Yuna must pray at. Yuna and Titus relate more as being children of famous fathers with immense legacies, and she believes his claim of being from Xanarkin, as he says the same things his father Jek did when Jek was serving as her father's guardian. The timing of Jek's disappearance from Titus' time and his appearance in Spira match up, so it seems to solve the mystery. Suddenly, Sin appears also in route to Kalika, and despite warnings of Waka, the crew fires harpoons at Sin, which caused the boat to be dragged along. Titus, Kamari, and Yuna follow Waka's advice to attack Sin's fin to drive him away, but it accomplishes little as Sin still makes his way to the Kalika port and absolutely devastates it with hurricane force. Titus himself hoped the attack would send him home, but since it didn't, he resigns himself to accepting Spira as his new home. As they make landfall and survey the damage, Yuna volunteers to perform the sending ceremony. In Spira, when someone dies, their spirit doesn't necessarily leave. They stay in this world, and many of them become resentful of the living and eventually become fiends, which are the monsters of this world. A summoner can send the dead to the far plane where they can rest in peace. Afterwards, they visit the temple, and Yuna proposes making Titus a guardian, which Lulu and Waka are unsure of. He proves himself in a battle against some leftover Sinspawn, though Lulu still has stinging words about their general optimism in regards to Titus. They have a brief encounter with the Luka Goers, a rival Blitzball team and favorite champion for the tournament, and the Aurochs don't back down. Within, they also meet another summoner named Donna, who is a bit pompous but driven in her own pilgrimage. While they wait, Titus receives an explanation on what the Faith are, which are people who once willingly sacrificed their souls and bodies to Yevon to fight Sin. While they became immortalized as statues of the temples, summoners who can call them can manifest their souls as the Aeons they summon. To himself, Titus also notes the hymn of the faith that is sung in the temples is a hymn that also existed in the Xanakuti Nu a thousand years ago. With Yuna gaining the fiery Aeon Bifrit, they sail Luka next for the Blitzball tournament, and on the trip, Waka and Lulu consider allowing Titus on as a guardian if he decides to, after the tournament, and if his memory doesn't return. For practice, he shows off his father's signature move, the Jack Shot, which convinces Yuna more that Titus' story is true, and gives more hope to the Aurochs. As they land, they are in time to also spot Maester Micah from the town of Bavel, and head of the Church of Yevon, whose 50 years as Maester is the reason the tournament is being held in the first place. In addition, he also comes with Maester Seymour, a man of the Guado race, who has recently been ordained after his father's recent death. He spots Yuna in the crowd, but moves on. 
Despite their astonishing bad luck, the Aurochs get seeded and only need one win to make it to the finals, but before the game, Unit comes for Titus, explaining that Orin has been sighted in the city nearby. But he wonders if the Orin Yuna was talking about is indeed the same Orin Titus knows. On the way, he teaches her how to whistle, and also learns that the reason there are men in towns and not cities in Spira is because when too many gather in one place, it attracts sin. As they continue looking for Orin, Kamari is suddenly caught and bullied by a few other Ronzo he knew from his past, and by comparison, Kamari really is rather small for a Ronzo. A brawl breaks out between them, but the tournament is starting and Titus is late for his game. It turns out their first opponents, the Albed Sykes, have kidnapped Yuna in exchange for the Aurochs losing. Lulu, Kamari, and Titus launch a successful rescue, while Waka plays harder than ever. After the rescue, Titus checks if this crew was the same one that once rescued him, but it's not, and Yuna questions if he met an Albed named Sid, who is her uncle. This of course means that Yuna herself is half Albed on her mother's side, and he's warned not to tell Waka, as he is very prejudiced against Albed. Still, Lulu sends up the signal and Waka catches it, and with the Aurochs, win a last second victory, breaking their 23 year losing streak on their own and earning a place in the finals. Just in time, the secret weapon of the Aurochs returns, Lulu stays behind with a recovering Waka, and Orin finally makes his way to the stadium. During the match, the passing game of the Aurochs and Titus' signature jack shot make all the difference as the biggest upset in history occurs. Before the game ends, Titus tags out and lets Waka take the field and be there for the team's tournament win. However, their victory is short as monsters somehow flood the stadium field and stands. Fortunately, Orin, the aged warrior monk with a heavy blade able to pierce any armor, the other guardian to Lord Baraska, and now considered the greatest guardian of all time, is there to suppress the threat. During the chaos, Maester Seymour summons his aunt Anima to annihilate the monsters and impress the crowd. After the tournament's over, Waka retires from Blitzball as promised, hands the team the Crystal Cup to take home, and assumes a full-time role as guardian. At the same time, Titus confronts Orin, blames him for ending up here at all, and reluctantly confirms that he was both Braska's guardian in Spira and Jek's friend in Xanarkin a thousand years ago. Orin says that, per Jek's request, his role was to watch over Titus and Xanarkin, then bring him here to Spira and deal with Sin, who is Jek. Titus could barely believe it, but once again has no choice but to come along to find out more, much to his frustration. After calming down, Titus follows Orin, who offers his services to Yuna as a promise to Braska, and conscripts Titus with him. Yuna cheers him up and promises to return the rescue favor if Titus should ever get lost himself. Next on their journey is the Temple of Jose, and as they travel to the Meehan High Road, they are met by Lucille, captain of the Jose Chocobo Knights, who pass along a warning of a large and vicious chocobo eater prowling in the area. They also meet a young acolyte of Yevon named Shalinda, who reveals that the upcoming anti-sin operation by the Crusaders is planned to involve heavy usage of forbidden machina. As they rest, Titus questions why Sin keeps coming back after being defeated, and questions Yevon's rationale that using Machina really is a strong enough reason for divine punishment. He also asks how they are to beat Sin at all, and Yuna explains that it lies with the final Aeon. To gain the faith of the final summoning that can defeat Sin, summoners must complete their pilgrimage and only then will they gain the Aeon needed, which incidentally takes place in Xanarkand. The next morning, Titus meets Rin, a friendly Albed shop owner who hands him a primer on the Albed language to become fluent himself. Suddenly, the Chocobo Eater himself makes an appearance in the nearby corral, and the group succeeds in defeating it. As thanks, Rin lets them borrow a Chocobo to ride all the way to the end of the Meehan Road, where the Crusaders are preparing for Operation Meehan. Surprisingly, they even run into Maester Seymour, who helps them pass the Stubborn Crusader checkpoint, and even more surprising, he is overseeing Operation Meehan, a joint effort by Albed and the Crusaders, and urges them to turn a blind eye to their blasphemous use of Machina for the sake of saving Spira from sin. Waka is disgusted by the whole thing, and he next learns the real story behind his brother Chapu. He was originally all set to play in the next Blitzball tournament and proposed to Lulu afterwards, but was suddenly recruited by their friend here, which resulted in deployment and getting crushed to death here in Jose. Chapu's preference for Machina guns versus the sword Waka gave him is also the major part of the bias Waka has against Machina. As the operation is about ready, Maester Kinok, one of the four Maesters of Spira and also leader of the Crusaders, is also present, and lets on that he expects this operation to fail, so he intends to just sit back and watch. The bitter atmosphere between him and his old acquaintance Orin makes things unsettling for everyone, and the operation begins. The plan starts with some captured Sin spawn to lure back Sin, who always returns to retrieve any living spawn it leaves behind, though it attacks a party upon release. Sin does indeed arrive, and the next phase is to unload heavy artillery into Sin while the Chocobo Knights deal with the spawn storming the beach. However, in a single blow, Sin releases a massive wave of energy that annihilates everyone on the beach. With the party, Seymour helps them out in battle, and his immense strength destroys the bait. However, even the massive Albed Lightning Cannon cannot beat Sin's shield, 
but it does turn away the monster. In the aftermath of the carnage, Yuna starts to send away the souls of the fallen, but Seymour suddenly and forcibly commands her not to in his presence. Titus admits he himself senses Jack in sin like Orin said, but can still only remember when Jack was a terrible alcoholic. Furthermore, Orin says that despite this being used as a political play by Maester Keenock to show the punishment of heretics and promote Yevon, it was really to show Titus that Jack wants Titus to kill the monster he's become. In addition, he also jabs that Titus can't afford to stay the crybaby he used to be when he was a little kid. As they arrive at the Jose Temple, they meet another summoner, Izaru, and he warns them that there's been a rash amount of summoners disappearing during their pilgrimage and suspects foul play. After resolving the Cloister of Trials, Yuna earns her next Aeon Summon, the Lightning Unicorn Ixion, and the group proceeds towards the Moonflow River, named such for the pyreflies that light up the river at night like stars. Boarding a massive animal called a Shoepuff as a means to cross the wide river, Orin reveals to Titus that Jack did actually quit drinking for good after he mistakenly attacked this very same fairy Shoepuff animal in the drunken stupor. During the fairy ride, Titus learns that Yevon basically forbids Machina meant for fighting, and Machina like the Blitzball Stadium are permitted. Suddenly, they are ambushed by Albed, who attempt to kidnap Yuna again with an underwater Machina, but fortunately Titus and Waka can fight underwater and defeat it. This all seems to indicate that the Albed are the ones behind the summoner disappearances. Later, Titus finds an Albed washed up on the shore, and as they unzip their wetsuit, he's pleased to see it's his old friend Riku, who survived the sin attack after all. It turns out, Riku was the one piloting the Machina Titus and Waka just beat, and as the group catches up, Yuna and Lulu read between the lines and talked with Riku privately in order to leave Waka in the dark about her being an Albed. Orin figures her out immediately given she has the telltale green eyes of an Albed, and permits her along only because Yuna wants her as a guardian as well. Waka is okay with it as well, and even doesn't suspect a thing, despite her ability to steal and in-depth knowledge of Machina. Next, the group arrives in Guado Salam, the home of the Guado, where Yuna is summoned to the personal home of Seymour. There they learn not only that Seymour actually has a mixed race parents like Yuna, where his father is a Guado and mother is a human, but his father, Maester Jiskel, is the one who converted the Guado to Yevon's teachings. Seymour shows them a device that shows the thoughts and memories of the dead, and shows them the Xanarkin Titus knew from a thousand years ago. He explains the first person to defeat Sin, Lady Unaleska, used to live in the old Xanarkin, and claims that it was the bonds of love she shared with Lord Zeon that allowed her to accomplish such a feat. At this time, Seymour proposes to Yuna and believes that they can do the same act today, but doesn't have to decide today. As Yuna urges them away, Seymour informs Orin he can smell the far plane on the old warrior, and questions why he's still here. Riku actually agrees that Yuna should quit the pilgrimage and marry Seymour, but everyone else agrees it sounds like a major publicity stunt to benefit only Seymour. While they are in Guado Salam, the town actually has a direct connection to the far plane, and people can actually go there and interact with the fireflies to recreate dead people from memories. Orin and Riku decline visiting the unique zone, and within, Yuna views her parents and Waka talks with his brother. Lulu is ready to bury her history with Chapu, and Tina says there will be others, and may even consider Waka, but she denies there ever being a chance of that. As they leave, the spirit of Lord Jiskel comes out, and Orin tells Yuna to send him before he becomes a fiend. Orin is strangely weakened during this event, and the spirit of Lord Jiskel somehow leaves a video recording behind. Wondering how it happened at all, Lulu explains that sometimes a soul may linger if a powerful emotion is tying it to this world despite being sent, and Orin says it likely means he died an unclean death. Yuna goes to inform Seymour of her decision, but their friend Shalinda informs them that Seymour left for his patron temple, the Makalania Temple, a while back. As it was their next destination anyway, they head there next. Getting there means crossing the perpetually lightning-struck area of the Thunder Plains. Riku happens to have a paralyzing fear of thunder due to an accident as a child resulting in her getting struck by a thunder spell. As they rest, Rin comes out and recognizes Orin, though wonders how he survived the grievous wound that Rin himself bandaged for him at the beginning of the last calm, though Orin evades the topic. Titus checks in on Yuna and sees her watching a recording which she claims was Lord Jiskel's will. Later, she announces to everyone her decision to marry Seymour after all, and has a reason she cannot tell them just yet. As they reach Makalania Woods, they find the crystals that grow in the woods are what the spheres they use are made of, and are able to store people's memories. They find one of the spheres Jack made along his journey ten years ago that Orin knew he left there, and Titus finds a personal message for himself. Even now, Titus is beginning to understand more of his father's situation and how much he actually did love him without knowing how to really express it. As they exit the woods, Seymour's attendant is there, and Yuna agrees to go with him to see Seymour. However, as soon as they start off, a group of Albed ambush them with an anti-magic cannon in tow. The leader of the attack is Riku's brother, who warns her their father will hear of this after the party wins, and Waka questions why Riku speaks fluent Albed. 
She reveals for herself that she is an Albed, and Waka is predictably upset as he immediately shuns her as a heathen. He's mad, but still allows her along. When they arrive, Yuna is already in the cloister with Seymour, and they discover among her things the recording sphere that she was hiding from them earlier. Within is the testament of Lord Jiskel, who states that his son Seymour bears a heart of darkness, and is manipulating the societies across spirit to bring destruction to all. He recorded all of this before being knowingly murdered by Seymour, and accepts blame for not being able to help him more when he suffered under racial prejudice when growing up as an mixed breed. Waka can barely accept the outright corruption of a maester he reveres so much, but everyone hurries as they all fear for Yuna's safety. When they arrive, Yuna has just succeeded in gaining the Aeon of the Icy Shiva, but when they accuse Seymour of murder, he unashamedly admits it. Yuna chooses to save with her guardians, and together they find themselves now fighting one of the four maesters. Yuna's summoning defeats even Seymour's anima, and as they kill him, they are soon discovered by his attendant. Orin urges Yuna to send Seymour, but the attendants carry his body away before it can be done. They destroy the evidence of Jiskel's fear and intend to kill the party as revenge, so the group decides to run. During the escape, the frozen ice lake they crossed earlier shattered under their feet by a yeti, and they all go tumbling down to the ravine below. Fortunately, they all survive, but both Waka and Yuna are still in shock at the events that just occurred. Yuna questions if the pilgrimage can still occur, and Orin points out the faith are what empowers the summoners, not the temples or their teachings, so they can and will continue, even if the temples want to fight them. At the very least, Yuna and Lulu agree they must sort out as much as they can, and go to Yevon's headquarters in Bavel to explain everything to Master Micah. They all agree, and as they climb out, they hear the hymn of the faith, and it turns out it's the faith itself that sings it. It turns out it's a hymn Jek and Titus both knew growing up in Xanarkin, and enjoyed singing. All of a sudden, the singing stops and Sin mysteriously makes an appearance. At this time, Titus feels and knows for sure that Jek truly is Sin, and still to this day enjoys the hymn, though the party is suddenly hurled away. The next thing he knows, Titus wakes up by himself in an oasis, and soon links up with everyone but Yuna. Riku actually knows where they are, as it's Beaconel Island, where the home of the Albed, literally named Home, is hidden. She leads him out of the desert there, and finds it's under attack by Yevon and the Guado, using fiends to kill everyone. Sid, leader of the Albed and Riku's father, informs them that it's mainly the Guado that are raising the place to get to Yuna, and even Waka empathizes with them. As they go to rescue all the summoners the Albed have captured, they find Donna and Izaru, who are helping send off the Albed who died protecting them from the Guado invaders. Titus wonders why the Albed even bother interfering with the pilgrimages to protect the summoners, as the Guardians can do fine for that, but Riku reveals the grim truth that everyone but Titus already knows. At the end of their pilgrimage, the summoner must sacrifice themselves to defeat Sin as they summon the last Aeon they earn, hence why it's called the final summoning. He's horrified at this truth, and at himself for being so naively optimistic this entire time about their mission. However, Yuna knew and accepted this a long time ago, and as Donna and Izaru agree, the end result is worth dying for, and that's what it means to be a summoner. He kicks himself angrily for painting a bright future towards beating Sin, and complaining about his own petty problems when all this time, Yuna would just smile and be brave despite knowing she would eventually be sacrificed. He now agrees with the Albed on finding a way to defeat Sin without sacrificing the summoner, and Sid in turn agrees to help them. Powering up the first airship in 1,000 years, their stored vessel, the Fahrenheit, takes off with all the surviving Albed on board. With their lost home now overrun by Guado and Fiends, the entire crew sings a heartfelt hymn as they choose to blow up their home with a barrage of Forbidden Machina, outrunning the resulting Megaton explosion. Afterwards, Orin and Sid butt heads over what to do after rescuing Yuna, and as Sid is Yuna's uncle, which makes Riku her cousin, he has no intention of letting her die. Yuna is found on their scanners in the grip of Seymour in this palace of St. Pavel, forced to carry out the wedding. They are surprised to see Seymour alive, but Orin states he really is dead, and that's just a hateful lingering spirit, and suspects that Yuna may actually be taking the opportunity to send him when he least expects it. As they get closer, a giant flying dragon, Evre the Sacred Beast, is the guardian to Pavel and intercepts them on their attack vector. They attack it on the deck of the ship and manage to defeat it despite taking some damage themselves. As the wedding proceeds, even Maester Kino notes the unusual gathering of fireflies, and actually has a full brigade of forbidden Machina and soldiers with Machina weapons at the ready. With no intention of docking, Sid and the Fahrenheit streak through the anti-air fire and drop anchor for the party to rappel down on their own and break through the front lines. Unfortunately, they are severely outnumbered and are eventually overwhelmed. During the standoff, Yuna begins to send Seymour, which starts to work, but Maester Micah holds the party hostage to stop her. Seymour proceeds to take Yuna for his own and still orders the party to be killed. However, this time, Yuna holds herself hostage and forces Seymour to back down. She orders the party to leave now while they still can and believe in her, as both a distraction and escape, she leaps from the balcony and summons Valifor to get away. 
Riku drops some flashbangs to cover their own escape as they all figure Yuna must be going to the temple in Bevel and continue her pilgrimage. Within the heart of Bevel, Waka is getting more and more disillusioned with Yevon as he sees proof after proof of the mass lies and hypocrisies that theocracy has spread. Once past the cloister of trials, Titus opts to break into the Room of the Faith since there's no worries about backlash from Yevon given their recent actions. Instead, Titus sees the Phantom Child again, and Orin explains that the Faith are human souls not allowed to rest, and instead join with summoners to create the Aeons they use. Seeing this happen in person, Titus understands it's been this Faith, the Faith of Bahamut, following him this entire time. As they come out, however, Maester Kina corners them and they are captured and placed on trial. Presiding over the trial is the final of the four Maesters, and it's Maester Kelkaronzo of the Ronzo. In defense of the charges read against her, Yuna explains the reason starts with Seymour killing his own father, the previous maester, to which Seymour nonchalantly confesses is true. In addition, it's pointed out that the duty of the summoner is to send the unsent, and Seymour is now an unsent. She urges Maester Micah to do so, but he only chuckles in response, revealing that he too is an unsent. All four maesters know this, which once again proves that behind closed doors, the clergy leaders of Yevon preach one thing and obviously do another. In fact, he explains further that the role of Yevon and its summoners is to perpetuate the eternal cycle of death and rebirth of sin, and control society through that cycle. After the trial, Orin muses on the spiral of death that permeates Spira, as death is only answered by more death to promote even more death, and yet the dead do not truly leave. They are sentenced to an inescapable dungeon, the Via Purifico, where they are expected to give up and die. Titus, Waka, and Riku are in the waterways while Orin and Yuna are brought before Izaru, who was ordered by Maester Kinok to deal with the traitors. They have a fight with their Aeons, and Izaru even uses the Aeon that Yuna just recently acquired herself from Bavel Temple, the King of Dragons, Bahamut. After losing, Izaru surrenders the way to the exit, and eventually everyone reunites. However, Seymour and Kinok were already there waiting for them, and Seymour chose to kill Kinok at this opportunity. He rationalizes that death is a release, and uses Kinok as an example. From there, he intends to not only let Spirit continue its death spiral, but push it, and end the suffering of everyone by killing them all. For that, he intends to take Yuna to Xanarkand and turn her into the next sin. He absorbs the dead soldiers and Kinok into himself and assumes a new form to kill the party with, but is still defeated, and the party retreats to Makalania Woods. Despite their win, Yuna's faith in Yevon has been all but lost. Titus goes to comfort her and finds her in the middle of a small pond. He tells her he knows of the final summoning and apologizes for his ignorant statements this entire time. He tries to persuade her to give up on the pilgrimage and live a normal life and be happy, but she finds she just can't give up. She starts to cry and at this time, Titus pulls her close and kisses her, reprieving her of her distress. Afterwards, she affirms that she cannot stop her mission to end sin, and Titus promises to be by her side always and still keep her alive. Their next stop is the Calm Lands, a point of no return for many summoners who choose these planes to wage battle against Sin. Though there is only wilderness beyond the Calm Lands, the next area beyond is Mount Gagazet, home of the Ronzo people and Kamari's home. They are halted by former Maester Kelk Ronzo, who resigned his position as Yevon's organization has begun to crumble under recent events, though will not allow them to pass on their sacred mountain, and Yuna confirms that she has cast aside Yevon and will abide by their rules no longer. Even Waka now stands firm of his denouncement of Yevon. Elder Kel questions her motives without the backing of the people or Yevon, and Yuna decidedly answers that she will deliver the calm to the people of Spira despite all that, and her conviction is felt even by him. He lets them pass, though the Ronzo duo from before still bully Kamari. When he was young, Kamari sparred and lost to Biren, the village's strongest Ronzo, resulting in his broken horn and shamefully leaving the mountain for it. Now, he faces a two-on-one duel against Biren and Yenke, and while Kamari wins, Biren takes his loss honorably. He not only proclaims Kamari's strength as the most powerful Ronzo, but also promises to delay any Yevon pursuers. Climbing the harsh Gagazet peak, they actually find a sphere recording left for Yuna by her father Braska, and he urges her to follow her heart no matter where it leads. As they push on, they find more and more unmarked graves for the summoners who have fallen to the harshness of the mountain, but the group pushes on as they're getting close to Xanarkand. Suddenly, Seymour appears before them all and taunts them by saying he's killed most of Kamari's village. He now makes a bid for Yuna to come with him, but this time he'll be the next Sen, and thus save Jet. He assumes a new monstrous form, but the party still beats him, but Yuna wants some answers to clarify what Seymour was talking about this time. It comes out that Jet became Sin, but that still does not deter Titus' will to fight. Later, they come across a huge wall of faith, and Yuna detects that someone is still drawing power from this mass collection of human soul sacrifices. When Titus touches the wall, he finds himself back in his old house, in his original Xanarkand. He finds the faith for Bahamut inside, and they chat, and soon Titus realizes this is all a dream, 
However, Bahamut quickly and concisely agrees that that is the point, and further explains that Titus isn't dreaming, so much so that he is a dream. Bahamut explains that a long time ago, there was a war between Xanergins and Bavel using Machina, though Bavel was winning the arms race. In an effort to at least save the memory of Xanarkin as it lost the war, the surviving summoners and citizens of Xanarkin all became faith and sacrificed their living souls en masse for a Xanarkin that is just a dream. The dreams of the faith summoned all of the buildings and people there, and Titus was always just one of the many dreams conjured in that summoning. Even Jekt was just another dream person created in this dreamland. Bahamut explains that he and the other faith are tired for dreaming for so long, though if they stop dreaming, everything ends. Now, because Jekt and Titus have been touched by Sin, the monster at the center of the spiral of death and Spira, they have both become more than just dreams and can now do something about ending the dreaming of the faith. After he awakes, he decides to keep things to himself and they all move on. Orin reveals that soon, Lady Unaleska, who still exists as an unsent, will be sending opposition to test their strength as she awaits their arrival to Xanarkin. And after defeating a mighty dragon, they finally lay eyes on the real Xanarkin. Titus picks up a recording sphere that Yuna dropped, and giving it a listen, understands that it's a long farewell that she recorded as far back as their evening in the Mihin High Road. As they enter Xanarkin proper, the density of Hireflies show them past guardians and summoners and their sacrifices in the past. They even see a young Seymour begging to stop his mother, who chose to sacrifice herself to become a faith that resulted in the anima Aeon Seymour uses today. They also see a young Ori with Braska and Jekt. After one more cloister of trials, they find the statue that holds the faith for the final Aeon, Lord Xeon, has no power left, as verified by the temple attendant. Lady Unaleska, for whom Yuna herself was named after, makes an appearance herself to reveal that one of her guardians must choose to sacrifice themselves and thus act as the faith for its final summonings, Aeon. What makes the final Aeon so strong is the bond its faith shares with its summoner, and that's why Unaleska chose her husband, Lord Xeon, as her faith. Yuna now sees the same dilemma her father went through with Orin and Titus's father, which resulted in Jekt volunteering to be the Faith and Orin acting then how Titus is acting now. Titus thinks to go ask Unaleska herself for any other ideas, and Yuna asks her directly if Sin will come back even after her efforts. Unaleska assures her that it's guaranteed, for the final Aeon that is summoned and defeats Sin becomes the new Sin in its place, so the cycle is eternal. Again, the dogma of atonement to remove sin was just another of Yevon's lies to give people hope and keep the cycle going. At this time, Titus reacts just as impulsively as the young Orin, who leaps just ahead of him and attacked Unaleska in retaliation for the foundation of deception supporting Spira and letting his friends die in vain. As a result, he is dealt a mortal wound by Unaleska, and after being prompted, Yuna herself says that while she would sacrifice herself, she chooses not to sacrifice any of her friends for false hope and to treat the effect and not the cause. At this time, the group chooses to bet on themselves, living despite sorrow rather than perpetuate the cycle of death to relieve pain, and fight the original summoner who defeated Sin, Lady Unaleska, who assumes gradually more monstrous forms. Against all odds, they defeat her fiendish form, and as she lies beaten, she reminds them that if they send her, they lose the only way to gain the final Aeon. In addition, even if they did find a way to beat Sin, her father, Yu Yevin, the original creator of Sin, would just make another one. Afterwards, as they leave Xanarkin to hunt Sin, Orin pauses Titus and confirms what was already suspected, and that is that Orin has been dead this whole time and has since lingered as an unsent. After Unaleska dealt a deadly blow, he somehow escaped, got past Matt Gagazet, received first aid from Rin the Albed, and encountered Kamari outside Bavel, where he gave Kamari the task to deliver Yuna from Bavel to Besaid to protect her, and then died. Afterwards, as an unsent, he rode Sin to the Dream's Anarchan, where he then watched over Jack's son, Titus. He shows him a bit of his past memories, as he used to be a part of the group of Auscasts. Jack was a drunkard from Xanarkin that many people thought crazy. Orin was a rising warrior monk who killed his career in the clergy for refusing to marry the priest's daughter. And Braska was a fallen summoner who had an albed. Titus actually sees his father reform over his journey and begins to forgive him, and as he leaves the Xanarkin dome, Sin is actually there waiting for him. As they seem to sense each other's thoughts, Sin leaves peacefully and waits for Titus to come to him. While they think of a new plan, they deduce that Jekt, who liked the hymn of the faith during life, still enjoys it as Sin, and that's what he was doing in Makalania. Since it seems to pacify the beast, they figure they can attack Sin when it lowers its guard as it listens to the hymn. In addition, they think to consult Maester Micah on the Sin situation given how they've ended the option of the final summoning, and the following of Yevon is short on followers right now. So much so, even their acolyte friend Shalinda has been promoted to Captain of the Guard, and Micah has reversed his slander on Yuna thinking she obtained the final Aeon. They meet him, but after stating that they have destroyed Unaleska, he gives up without offering help. 
Instead, Bahamut offers some advice on how to beat the source of the problem, Yu Yevin. Yu Yevin it used to be a summoner without equal, but now exists purely as an enemy that cannot stop summoning. Existing within Sin, when Sin is defeated by the newest final Aeon, Yu Yevin joins with the final Aeon and turns into the new Sin and keeps on summoning. Instead, Bahamut urges Yuna to summon her Aeons when confronting Sin and warns that ending this cycle will end the dream supporting it. Titus understands the deeper meaning of that warning, and Yuna catches something amiss, but Titus tries to play it off. As they leave, they coordinate for everyone to start singing the Hymn of Faith when they see their ship in the sky, and send that message to everyone in Spira, which results in calming Sin so they can approach. As they zero in on Sin, Sin says he has a plan to pierce through Sin's armor and get them inside. As they get close, Sin fires a shot that rends the surface of the world in eight directions, and as they navigate closer without wrecking, they start targeting Sin's joints. Managing to damage the monster to the point of slowing down, Sid takes the shot with the airship's freshly deployed main cannons, striking it dead on to sever an entire arm. Repeating the action for the opposite side, they cripple Sin again, but the main cannon breaks. Titus opts to keep the pressure on, and the group leaps onto Sid's back to destroy another critical node on Sin's body. The party returns to the airship as Sin crashes down outside the city below, and before they assault it, Yuna realizes what Bahamut meant earlier. Sin is reborn when Yu Yevin merges with an Aeon, so when the Aeon said they'll help, they meant to act as live bait to lure Yu Yevin out and merge with them, and then be destroyed while they are still small. She recalls that Bahamut also said Yu Yevin keeps summoning within Sin, but questions what exactly, and Titus knows the answer to be the dream of the faith themselves. As they get closer, Sin opens its mouth and the group finds themselves transported to a plane of existence within Sin. Within, they encounter Seymour one more time, delirious with power, and after he ascends into a new form, they still destroy the power-hungry and hate-driven maester, and Yuna wastes no time to now send him once and for all. Further in, they find the ruins of a Blitzball Stadium, center to which is Jekt himself, and Titus talks with his father for the first time in 10 years. Jekt admits he's been fighting to stay in control, and they came in time to end him before he loses control to sin completely. Jack drops overboard and a dream Xanarkin around them lights up and Jack's final Aeon form rises up with Yu Yevin in control now. As they defeat Braska's final summon, Titus succeeds in finally overcoming his father. Titus is there to then catch his father in his final moments and despite their jabs at each other, still understand each other as he fades away for good. Around them, Yu Yevin is searching for a new Aeon to merge with and Yuna calls upon her faithful Aeons as she worked hard to gather and fought alongside with their entire journey. Immediately, each ally is possessed by Yu Yevin, and one by one, Balafor, Ifri, Ixion, Shiva, Bahamu, and others are all battled and destroyed as Yu Yevin eventually has nowhere left to run. Assuming the appropriate form of a small parasite, Titus takes this time before battle to announce that he'll disappear after the battle, but with no regrets. Demolishing the 1000 year cycle and the progenitor of Spira's eternal death cycle, Titus, Orin, Yuna, Waka, Lulu, and Riku destroy Yu Yevin, and with it, Sin. As the game concludes, around the world, people witness the end of Sin, and within every temple, the Faith finally retire from dreaming for 1,000 years. Their mission complete, Yuna begins with sending Orin, now able to finally rest. Next, she performs a sending for every Aeon as well as Sin, and as it's witnessed the world over, countless goodbyes and thanks are said as the Age of Summoners comes to a close and even the Wall of the Faith is allowed to rest at last, along with their dreams. Abruptly, Titus knows his time is up, and without making it a long goodbye, even Yuna cannot make it stop. Before it's too late, she confesses her love for him, and with the last of his strength, he embraces her, but moves on as the story comes to a close, and he makes peace with everyone in the far plane. As Final Fantasy X ends, we see Yuna still has not given up on searching for Titus, and addresses the populace of Spira on the uncertain future to come. She calls on a stronger unification of Spira, and to never forget the dreams that have faded. As the game ends, we see Titus wake up underwater and begin swimming towards the surface as the game leads into its sequel, Final Fantasy X 2. Final Fantasy X has enjoyed the success of selling over 9.5 million copies worldwide.